Hi, Catherine. Um, thank you very much for giving your time today. My name's Alex, I'm one of the Royal Commissioners, and we really appreciate the time, um, not only this morning, but the time you put into your report, which obviously I've had a chance to read. So it's great we can have a conversation about things this morning. It's really a chat. Um, yep. And, and it's great for you. I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing your experiences and thoughts with the Commission um, to help us to get to better outcomes, which is what we're trying to do. So, right. fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, I've, I've kind of been reading through um, your submission again this morning, and I think it really highlights some important things that we're really considering right now. So this issue around people who are experiencing both um, challenges around AOD and mental health. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, it's always disappointing to hear people's experiences. But I wanted to start with your experience at general practice because you talk a lot about um, some of their challenges and some of your challenges with finding a good GP. So can you talk about that experience first? Yeah, I was very lucky to find the doctor that um, I found at the time I really needed um a doctor not not just for um mental health addiction purposes but just my overall um general well-being which you know i mean everyone talks about a holistic approach these days and i mean yeah you know mental health and addiction can have impact on physical as well so you really need a a good supportive gp that um is non-judgmental um, mm -hmm. and is open to your experience and can help you because I mean yeah the addiction for me led to um, high blood pressure heart um, problems and things like that so it's yeah it's it's good to have someone on board because I had a, a great support team in the end um, as I say I had you know someone for AOD someone for my mental health and then my GP who got the whole overall picture as such. So how easy was it to find a GP that you think I understand some of your issues that you were going through? Well, the GP I found, um, when I first did my initial intake um, for addiction through oh, Anglicare, I saw a lady from Anglicare and she recommended this doctor and I never looked back. Like once I met her, um, her first words were, you know, you're not alone. There is a way out. Mm. And that was comforting um, because prior to that, you know, I, I'd had the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which made sense um, following my experience, but it was like, okay, well, if this alcohol, um, you know, this need for alcohol is still there and that's symptomatic, then I really need to address the underlying issues, not just keep trying to avoid and um, numb out. And, I mean, there was a lot of pain behind my drinking and I think it was, well, it was trauma. And that, that's my area of interest is um, trauma related substance abuse because I it's not as simple as just put the bottle down or mm. put the substance aside there's no hope for um, recovery if you're not addressing the underlying mental health side of it the anxiety the fear the um, all those sort of things that were triggers for me and I just went back to my coping mechanism which really wasn't coping it was coping but it wasn't processing um so any amount of work i did with a psychologist kind of was pointless because um the actual sessions would trigger me and then even though they were they were good and opening i'd go home and just drink because i couldn't handle those feelings and emotions that it was bringing up so it's it was like this you know circle for a while this looping so what do you think um you've talked about gp what else do you think helped break the circle um medications she put me on um she did blood tests and everything to make sure my liver was you know okay because a lot of those 
um, anti-craving and, and whatever medications uh, sort of metabolise through the liver. So she needed to make sure that, you know, my liver was okay to go on certain medications. And whatever she did worked. It just worked. And it was, it was a lot of my determination as well um, to process, to allow myself the time to sit through things and process. And while I was still using alcohol, that wasn't a possibility. So I felt stuck. You know, basically I was stuck. Um, Do you think that's important? Um, so so I, I, I think if I'm reading your story right, you know, there were some um, different times when you found a bit of help, but then things fell back or, you know, it kind of was a bit up and down through a bit of period. But do you think part of it is also about the right timing? So the timing of yeah. you finding, yeah. you know, so you were ready to also, but with the right person and the right help? Absolutely. It is timing. Timing's got a lot to do with it. Um, and, yeah, I know that that is a very difficult, um, the per well, in my case, I had to admit to myself that I had a problem. Um, and not a lot of people will own that because it, it is a crutch. It's like if I say something, they're going to try and stop me and I need it. Um, so it needs to be, a, I'm not saying that people should be going through some sort of therapy while they're intoxicated. That's just ridiculous. I mean, they need to, to have those moments where they're, um, receiving therapy they go away, but there needs to be follow-up, I think, once a person leaves that office um, because it will raise things um, and they're just going to go back to their way of coping with those things that they're not really able to process. And it takes time. It's, it's a stop-start process. It's not a one-stop shop for a lot of people. It's um, so quite there's something there's something for us about the system design where we've got to make sure um, that the system's kind of there and ready to step forward when, you know, when the opportunity is there to kind of make the connection and, and be of assistance. So it, it's sort of like the system at the moment is designed, you know, here's your 28 days. We've given it to you. So very kind of, we've, We've given it to you and you should be making the best of it and, and not really kind of following through to say, well, you know, we, we just need to hover here because we might need to do another, like we need to kind of stay engaged. We need to stay, the system's very stop-start, isn't it, at it, the moment? Yeah, it's that post-discharge and that's what got me interested in the peer support aspect because um, People, you know, do these 28-day programs and it's great. You know, you're in a safe space. You, you know, you, you clear your head. You're getting to sort of address issues. But then they go back to their normal life. Um, and they relapse. Hmm. And, you know, I'm not to say that, that even with, with support that they won't do that. But at least they've got someone to bounce off um, because I know in my case, every time I, I lapsed or whatever, I the self-loathing, that was worse than anything, that just that hating myself. Um, yeah, it, it's, and you know, that lowers your self-esteem and it just becomes this vicious spiral. So somehow there needs to be someone to empower the person and not judge and you know okay well you know that was yesterday or whatever let's let's keep going um because the journey out of that addiction side of things is very much a hitting speed humps all the time and um you know it is that 10 steps forwards five back um until the real underlying thing is addressed. And sometimes that takes time because people don't even know why. Um, because 
some people can, and, and this is what concerns me with COVID, um, the increase in substance use mm. during COVID. People are using it as a, you know, they talk about with um, substance use, whether it's recreational or, you know, you are dependent or it's situational. And I think people are viewing this as situational, which is dangerous because mine was situational at the time. And then when I removed myself out of that situation, I couldn't put it down. Mm. I hadn't resolved anything. I hadn't um, processed the whole thing. It was like, I don't like it. Um, and, you know, I stayed in a job where I, I would go home and drink because I couldn't cope with the way I was spoken to, the way I was treated, the things that were going on, the lies, the deceit, all that. And people are in relationships like that every day. So if their coping strategy, they tolerate far more than they would normally. And sometimes people don't even know that what they're experiencing is not normal. It's their normal. So, so what do you, um, I mean, I think, I think you're speaking to something that people are pretty worried about is that people are behind closed walls and doors at the moment. Um, uh, putting in patterns and behaviours and um, dealing with a whole range of stresses in in um, what might seem like a reasonable way in this context, but are, are going to lead to ongoing challenges. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? What should we be doing around COVID? Uh, well, I, I, I was... I think the advertising um, on television, not, not the... Um, you know, the alcohol places and free delivery and all that. I think that's just terribly remiss in this climate. Um, but I saw the ad the other day that, you know, don't let a, a little monster become a big monster. Mm. Um, so just raising that awareness of... Because do you think people really don't understand that having maybe, you know, uh, drunk a couple of nights, you know, Friday and Saturday night or something, and now they're finding they're doing it at seven... Do you think people don't understand what that might be leading to? Yeah. I think you're right. I do think you're right about that. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it wouldn't be them. It's not me. It's I, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't be someone that would get a problem. So everyone, it's very hard for people to understand how easy it is to fall into the trap. Yeah, 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 that's right. It wouldn't be me. It would be someone else that would get the problem, but not me. Yeah, I, that's right. I think it'll be okay. So, and it's really concerning because... Um, you know, even when you hear that, well, it's concerning, especially to do with domestic violence. Um, that's a concern. At the moment, you don't know what's going on behind closed doors at the moment. No one knows. And I think coming out of this lockdown, there's going to be a need for huge um, support and access to things. Um, you know, people might suddenly realise that working from home, they suddenly don't like their job anymore. And they've been masking that by coming home and just drinking or, you know, they're in relationships that, oh, I really don't like this. Like, this is not really my ideal situation. I've realised I'm drinking to tolerate something that's intolerable. Or, um, yeah, I, I just don't think... It's, it's a dangerous, dangerous um, situation for some because... As I say, once lockdown's lifted and whatever, people, some, will struggle. Um, like, oh, gee, you know, everything's back to normal, but I'm not. So, so one of the things you um, mentioned in your um, statement that helped you at a point in time was Lifeline. What, I think you actually used the word awesome in the statement why why what, what was ring lifeline at that point in time because that's obviously one big part of what people are recommending at the moment why was it awesome i think because it is a stranger to talk to mm -hmm. um so many people don't want people to know what they're going through even people closest to them like the you know family gp their um psychologist or counsellor or family or whatever. So it was talking to a stranger. I think that was, um, and just not being judged. 
and then Lifeline at the time I phoned, I've, I've actually contacted them twice. I contacted them when I was about ready to just leave this world. I just could not cope. Um, and they rang the local police station. The police station phoned the PSOs at the station because I was in a car park. Um, and then, yeah, they sort of set the ball rolling. They didn't just chat and, oh, well, you know, you'll be all right. Tomorrow's another day. Um, they put in some action there and then that I needed. And I'm ever so grateful for that. And then another time I relapsed about 18 months later and was so disappointed in myself. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, they've got some great people on the end of, of that line. Um, and I just wish a lot more people would reach out just to have a chat. You know, it doesn't have to be a life um, threatening situation, just someone to talk to, a stranger, you know, um, that's not going to judge and won't say, oh, well, you know, gee, you know, you've been hit a bit out this week or, you know, all those things where you feel bad enough in yourself anyway. Um, and sometimes the people closest to you can not give you the right reaction or response and just someone impartial. Um, yeah, it was a blessing to just contact someone that I could just have a chat to. You also talk about a few other um, groups that helped you along the way, you know, where um, people were helpful. And I think the Partners in Recovery was another time when you found um, helpful support and advice rather than anything else. What, why was that a period of time where you think that model worked? What, what was it about that? Alex, it was the timing of everything. I'd, um, I'd hit a point in June of 2016, where I just did not want to go on. Yeah, at that. Is that the first time you came in contact with the peer workers? Um, as I joined Wellways, I started to become well myself, um, and I did some courses through them on facilitating my recovery programs, which helping other people was helping me. Um, because I, you know, and then I suppose as a peer, adopting the peer worker um, type role, to me, I took that very seriously. Like, well, I've got to be a role model. I've got to set an example, even though the model of peer work is to walk alongside someone, you know, you know better, you know, but you're setting an example. And that's, um, that helped a lot with my recovery. And it opened up a lot of things for me. Um, Training wise, and yet peer workers, I think, um, you know, you, you get a good peer worker. I'm not saying that, that, you know, I mean, there's some that, that aren't, but it's like in every industry, it's, you know, you get good psychologists, you get ones, but it's not, it's about clicking with a person. It's not whether they're better or worse, it's about the right fit for someone. Um, and that's why I wanted to learn a lot more about mental health and things like that, because I've only got my experience with trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know what it's like for a schizophrenic, or I don't know what it's like for someone with bipolar. Um, so I wanted that exposure to, to know um, what other people are struggling with and certain aspects of their mental health issues can lead to addiction. And, so I wanted a better understanding on um, on that to be a better peer worker as such. What, what, why do you think peer worker model works? What, what, what are the components of a peer worker model? It's non-clinical. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, we, with the dual diagnosis council, um, of course, you know, of late we can't do it, but we would go into various facilities and run peer groups for an hour just and it was just chatting to people and um yeah you still have to have boundaries and everything when you you know talking to people but sometimes opening up about your lived experience gives them permission to open up about theirs and they don't feel so alone 
Um, now, I mean, of course, you know, when you've got professionals, they, they can't cross that line, um, which, you know, makes sense. Like, anyone could struggle with addiction. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't, um, or mental health or, or whatever. It's, it's, and people in certain industries, um, it's not so much about, well, I suppose, you know, we're all good at stigmatising ourselves and discriminating against ourselves, I think, more than anyone. Um, but just opening up about things to total strangers in that setting, they you leave there and and they don't, you know, they, they're lifted. And that's, um, and we've had numerous times where people have said, oh, can you be my peer worker outside of this when I leave? And, and it's like, well, it doesn't work like that, but we can put you on to to someone, um, it's like, no, no, I want to, you know, I want to work with you because you've made some sort of connection. Connection is so important um, in recovery. Just, yeah, the right people and, um, yeah, just to be open and honest, I, like I've got no qualms about telling my story to a bunch of strangers because it does help give them comfort and, you know, permission to open up themselves. Are you, um, I, I know you've um, been doing the cert for you were when you were doing the, um, the, the witness statement. Um, is this kind of the, the career that you're heading to? Is, do you think this is kind of where you'll end up, is in the um, supporting people through the peer kind of structures? That's what I hope to, yeah. yeah. Um, What's your worries about, I mean, just, I'm interested in it as a workforce because we're working on, in another part of the commission, we're working on that as well. Um, as someone who's looking at taking this on as a career, what are the pros and cons of that? What are you thinking about? What's worrying you? What's exciting you about heading into that career? Um, look, I, you know, I know myself. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm fully recovered. Um, I still have triggers on things that, um, but I've still got a lot, I've got a lot more support around me than I ever had. And I mean, recently my, both parents passed away. No, I just lost it. Um, for a couple of weeks there and I pulled myself back on, you know, on track. I thought, no, this is, this is not the way to cope. This is not the way to, you know, um, process but I, I didn't sort of beat myself up because it was a horrible time you know with them in hospital and then we lost dad suddenly and then mum passed away 16 days later um that's hard. a horrible time and I could see myself slipping again um sorry I've wandered off the track here but so I kind of doubt myself whether I'm I suppose recovered enough to be support mm. for someone else. But then I kind of look at, well, I've been through that now. That's even as horrible and it's, I mean, it's still horrible. Um, it's, it's another lived experience of something mm. Mm. that could connect with another person. And there's a, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities in, in the peer work, area because public speaking I used to be petrified of now you can't stop me <laughs> I get nervous it's like it, step aside I'm here um and I just love talking and from the heart and and just getting that um yeah like once I couldn't even speak I would choke up I'd cry I'd run off and now I've got over that um and that's just time so, I mean, I, I, and I love running the groups. Um, I'm probably more group orientated than one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah, and, and just to see the change in people over those, the course of those um, recovery groups and things like that, just the hope that comes back into their eyes and the, yeah, yeah the, the determination and, you know, you empowering them. You, it's all not doom and gloom. It, it's, and they 
want to end up being peer workers as well, which, um, because a lot of people after they go through things think, well, I'm useless, I've lost my career, I've lost my marriage, I've lost this, I've lost that. Um, and they don't see a lot of value in, in themselves and, but experience is, is valuable. Um, Absolutely. It's the only way we can have empathy for others. I, I think it's in, I mean, I, I would encourage you because I think your story and your experience is less um, there's less people who will talk about the um, addiction and AOD aspects and you know because you're talking here about stigma and I'd like to kind of talk about that in a minute um, so and yet it's the experience of so many right so it's a it's, it's kind of a hidden experience for some for a lot of people and so I think having peer workers that can speak to both is incredibly important and not that common. Um, so anyway, I would encourage you to keep going if, if that's something that you feel strongly about. Look, I, I do have a great passion for it. Um, the actual direction with it, I'm, I'm not sure. I love the work with the Dual Diagnosis Council, but sometimes we'll, we'll go to places and it's like, oh, who are you? And it's like, oh, well, you know, we're members of the dual diagnosis. What's dual diagnosis? Oh, mental health and, you know, um, alcohol and other, oh, I don't take drugs. I don't. And they lose interest. It's like, well, you don't have to have that problem. We, you know, we can still talk to you about your mental health. And um, yes, yeah, so there's some, some people are, are quite funny in that. It's like, well, oh, no, I, I, you know, I don't. Well, well let's let's talk about stigma for a minute because i think that is about that you know um you know it, it, it's like the stigma about mental illness but there's you know kind of it's like an extra whammy of stigma when you also start talking about aod in the system um and in the community i think so you talk about your personal stigmatization and and i understand that but talk to me about how you've experienced stigma um from others and what do you think at a kind of system design because when we're trying to think about the system how do we start to combat that pretty ingrained community stigma because pretty ingrained um it is and i i think what i experienced was because i couldn't talk about well i went so long without being diagnosed with anything and i struggled with the addiction so in my eyes that's all anyone saw someone with an addiction. It's like, yeah, but you don't know, like, I mean, I, I didn't start to struggle with alcohol till I was 40 years old. So, mm. um, yeah, I went, I went through something that for me was quite traumatic and I couldn't talk about it to anyone. And I didn't open up about it until, oh, well, till after I got the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Cause I just thought I was someone that couldn't cope with life. Couldn't, was too soft, too sensitive to, um, yeah, all this sort of stuff. Like I just kept putting myself down the whole time. Well, you know, all I am is just this girl that, that drinks and someone said something to me, which just, yeah, it, it was a, a this girl that said to me, I've done all this damage to you. And um, if you say anything, I'll deny it all and put it this way. Who's going to believe you now? You've got a drinking problem. And that's exactly. I read, I read that. I, and I mean, that was a terrible part of your experience. The, the description about um, not just what happened with work, but some of that ongoing stuff that happened with other colleagues. And so I, yeah. I just I it was really, really it was like something out of a horror movie and I, I honestly thought, who is going to believe me? Because she was the one I confided in. Um, so she was the only one that really knew what was going on. And then, yeah, to do that and then say, you know, who's going to believe you now? And I thought, yeah, you're right. No one's going to believe me because you're the only one that knows the truth. Um, so I didn't say anything to anyone. hide it for longer, didn't it? I just kept it inside. Yeah. I just, I just, from that point, 
that was the turning point where it went from a, um, you know, a few drinks a couple of times a week to full on, whoa, um, yep, just 24-7 um, there for a while. And I just thought, how, how could someone do that? Like, um, yeah, it was a complete shock and a, um, I lost faith in humanity. Um, yeah, the, you know, the world just wasn't somewhere I, I liked anymore. Like, if someone can do that and, um, yeah, that, that put me into a state of shock. So, so what, from our point of view, um, different countries do different things. So, you know, we've got the equivalent of are you okay and those sort of things, you know, to sort of try and actually raise in the community's mind that what you say and do does matter. Right? It, 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 yeah, the old know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but, well, that's nonsense. Cause, yeah. Yeah. So, so from, you know, your experience, are there things that you think the Commission should be considering in relation to stigma? We talked about, you know, one of the things we should be doing is perhaps in difficult times like now with COVID, raising awareness of some of the kind of nearly the the traps people can fall into, the, the, the ways in which people can be more resilient. So, you know, just make sure you're not drinking too much at the moment or all of those things that we were talking about before. I think there needs to be emphasis on choice. Right. We all have a choice. Um, even people that abuse others have a choice. Mm. So if you're psychologically or mentally, emotionally affected by someone's behaviour, you're not responsible for it. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be really emphasised because I blame myself for years. I thought, well, it must be me. I, I kept saying, what's wrong with me? What issues have I got that I keep attracting people like this? Like, what have I done? Um, and it took a long time for me to realise that I'm not responsible for other people's behaviour, but I am responsible for mine. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm making the choice to drink. No one's pouring it down my throat. And, you know, um, it was my way of, of sort of building up this Dutch courage to compete against. I had this deluded thought that, um, if I'm completely sort of numb, then no one can hurt me again. But I was hurting myself and I was probably more vulnerable than ever mm. when you're intoxicated or, or whatever. So I, I think the emphasis definitely needs to be on, on choice. We all have a choice as to how we behave, what we do, what we say. Um, and back to the old golden rule, you know, do to others that you, you know, that you want done to you. Like, I think that sort of, it's all, the whole world's become very competitive and, um, you know, I'm going to hurt you before you can hurt me, this sort of mentality. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, people will do things just for the sake of doing it. Mm. But I, I think, the, I think how we make a kinder society, isn't it? It is. I mean, that is an overall battle because... I think they're yeah. trying to do it in the schools with the kids. Well, it's got to start there, I think. That's yeah, where it yeah. and I think they're also trying to teach the kids to... You, you Exactly what you just said, you know, that, that um, you can control how you respond. You, you can... You, you have a choice about how you... Um, how you take it on board, whether or not you do or don't, this is your, you know. The, yeah, the, so maybe, you know, that uh, some sort of thing along the lines of, you know, just for today, what are you going to choose to do and say? Mm. And, you know, sure, we've got, are you okay? But there's something that, you know, when, when you go through sort of your own therapy and, People are so out of touch with their feelings and everything like that. You know, maybe instead of, are you okay? How are you feeling? Mm. That is a tough question to answer sometimes. Mm. 
Well, if you answer it honestly, you're often exposing yourself. Yes, exactly. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I wanted to, so we talked about partners, we talked about peer. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about in relation to um, any of the things that you've found in your experience um, that were helpful? Just so that I'm kind of, you know, taking the, the, the kind of positives from the thing. We've talked about that Lifeline was helpful at a certain point. Finding the right GP was obviously helpful to you. Um, and you also talk in your statement about the fact that um, quite a lot of GPs don't have an understanding or experience around um, complex mental health challenges and AOD. And I must say, I think trauma and PTSD is one of the things um, GPs have often told me that they don't feel well equipped for. They're not, not bad on depression and they kind of got their heads around anxiety, but, but the issues around PTSD particularly, they often find quite challenging. So I think your experience reflects what people have told me. But are there any other bits of the, your journey where you think if, if, if the commission could really consider um, increasing the capacity to do something, or, you know, that, that you found helpful, but that, um, you know, just didn't last or something like that. Is there anything else we should keep in mind? Well, partners in recovery was an absolute um, wonderful model, wonderful program. If that could be kept going, I believe under NDIS, it's more one-on-one -on -one these days. Um, you haven't talked about your NDIS experience. What are, what's NDIS giving you? Well, they've given me, luckily I've got unlimited psychology appointments, which right. is the okay. main thing I wanted because what would happen to, I mean, I, I found a really good um, psychologist, which was referred to me. She was referred to me by the doctor that I had. And, but I didn't have a mental health plan. And when I did it sort of, um, there was still a gap. And I found I couldn't go as often as I wanted to. Um, and then, so when, I got the NDIS plan for myself. It was, that was the main thing I wanted um, because, you know, sometimes you need a, a psychologist once a month, sometimes fortnightly, sometimes weekly, depending on what's going on in your life. So that to be funded for me was, um, that's probably the most of what I utilise it for. I mean, there's things like, you know, if I needed someone to come in and, and just, clean or, or, you know, um, if I was unwell, come in and make me a cup of tea. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, I've got funding that I'm not, I'm not utilising the whole lot, mm. but the psychology for me is the most. That? Um, the other thing you talk about is the importance of, um, improving, well you, well, you talk about the, the thing that lots of people talk to us about is, you know, you can't get mental health services if you're considered to be using and you can't often manage your addiction if you're not getting the mental health services. So what, what's your sort of suggestions to us about how we could better manage the AOD mental health interface? Well, no wrong door yeah. approach. Um, I think if, because sometimes people won't, it takes time to open up about the addiction because they're not actually ready to deal with that. They don't recognise the underlying factors might be contributing to it. So yep. they're sort of going about getting um, help the wrong way themselves. Um, people, it boils down to the person. The person needs to be totally honest. And uh, the only way to get that honesty is through the person being ready. Yeah. That, you can't make someone. Well, I think your description is that by the system likes it that you get your AOD sorted before your mental health because it says. Yeah, you that, that, but, but for you, that didn't work because every time you got your AOD sorted, it was all undermined by the fact you hadn't actually had a chance to really think about or get support around your mental health issues. Yeah, because the trauma and, you know, all that were actually a symptom. Mm. Um, you know, vice versa, like the, the alcohol was my coping mechanism. Mm. So that was a symptom of my, mm. um, mental health issues. So I don't, 
I don't believe that, that I'm not saying, yes, yeah, see someone when they're intoxicated or under the influence. That's just ridiculous. Um, that's not safe for either. It's not, it's pointless. But what I'm saying is don't put this, you've got to be free of your addiction before we can help you with, you know, that, that's just, that's not going to work. It needs well, to. I think that. your story is the classic example. It just meant that um, you'd work really hard, but then it would relapse because. That's right. You know, you hadn't kind of had a chance to look at the other stuff. So the therapy sessions are so important because, you know, when someone is caught up in addiction, their, their brain's changed, their neural pathways have changed, they don't process and cope with things that they used to. So they need really good support for someone to raise that awareness in them to suggest things that they might not have thought of or, um, yeah, and to just take ownership and um, choose to, to, well, it is choice. It's, it's choice. Make healthy choices. Um, Just in our last little bit of time, is there anything that, you know, you want to kind of have in the commission's mind about, um, you know, we are coming up actually in the last few months of determining how the new system will look. And I, and I do want to say that you're confirming um, a lot of what we've been looking at, which is this issue around integrating AOD and mental health in a much more um, flexible way, if I could put it that way, so that, um, you know, you're definitely not, you know, we don't believe people should be excluded um, uh, because of their AOD from the mental health system and, and how do the systems work better together? So, because there's a lot of strengths in the AOD system too. I don't want to kind of dismiss what it can do as well. Um, so we're kind of onto that a little bit um, and trying to think through how that might best be considered. So are there, are there any things that, that you feel like, you know, I really want the commission to kind of crack a nut or do something or, because this is your, kind of your chance to, to give us any kind of uh, recommendations you feel pretty strongly about? Um, I don't think people are going to realise that they've got a problem with a substance until they try and put that substance down. Yeah. In other words, they'll just keep doing what they're doing because it's become in the end, literally a habit to the point. Some people don't even know why they do it. It's just what I do every day. Um, and this is why I'm thinking with this lockdown and everything, how dangerous, dangerous it can become an unhealthy habit. It might start off as a coping, you know, situational, um, like with a lot of things, like with trauma or grief or anything. But if they don't process the reason why they're opting to dissociate or avoid or whatever with substance, I don't want to lose my train of thought here. It's quite good. Um, they may not see themselves falling into that pattern. Yeah. So what happens when another trauma happens? What happens when more grief? It's just going to layer and they don't know yet how to process whatever it is, the, the psychological impact, the emotions. the So I think the emphasis needs to be on why did you pick up that first drink or why did you have that? Um, what is it about the substance that's giving you what you think you need at the moment? Okay, so what, I've, what I've written down, just so I've captured it, you know, I've written down around the awareness and, and how people aren't always aware of um, how addiction starts and, you know, how, how it is part of a cycle of um, experience and coping and stuff. But I've kind of, in the end, I've written, why are you drinking, not just that you are drinking? 
that's kind of my shorthand for well yeah yeah, yeah. like what you know, and it's like, oh, I don't have a problem. It's like, no, well, then go for a week or so without it. Yeah, so the kind of, we, we call it health like, literacy when we're talking about this stuff, but, but people's understanding about what it is, what actually are the consequences, what is actually problem drinking or any other substance use. You know, people can kind of dismiss it, particularly around alcohol, I think. I think people dismiss um, severity and amounts and all that sort of stuff pretty quickly. I do. They do, but it, it's, you know, what they've got to realise is to get the same effect eventually, they're going to have to have more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. also what you described, which is, um, and, and as a younger woman than you are now, you obviously were coming across things like, you know, heart disease and stuff that, that wouldn't have been a normal part of your healthier living um, related to your AOD. So... I think people don't always understand the physical consequences either. No, well, my blood pressure was that high that um, even though I was on blood pressure tablets, it it was pointless while I'm still having alcohol because, uh, well, I was a a stroke risk. risk. I mean, that, you know, it was so high. Um, And, of course, blood pressure is one of those silent killers. You you don't really get many symptoms. You might get a headache, um, but you're not really aware of the the impact it's having on you and i think i think that's where the peer workforce also can have because because it's a light touch if i could put it that way a peer worker ring you up and say how are you traveling yeah is, is quite different to the police person turning up at your front door because i think it you know even if not being as i say with a peer worker not being in a clinical space as such so um but I think a peer worker also has to have that um, agreement with whoever they're supporting as such that, you know, if you are, like, everything stays between us, it is confidential. However, if I, you know, yeah, yeah. notice that you're becoming a danger to yourself or others, I will have to actually contact someone for your safety and that of others. Um, I think everyone needs to have that in place. Um, that needs to be standard. Um, but, yeah, I think just the connection for people and, you know, I mean, deinstitutionalisation was a great thing, but where did those people go? Yeah, yeah. Well, into flats like next door to you. is actually actually yeah, that's right. Actually so, and, and, yeah, it's, um, it's disturbing for people when that happens. Um, if they don't understand, like, uh, luckily, I kind of have got a bit of an idea with taking an interest in mental health and whatever that I don't see it as a, a you know, an opportunity where others do to abuse the person or um, threaten them with police. It's like, no, well, let's find their worker and um, take a bit more of a gentle approach to help this person than... Bring in well, the we're back to people being kind, aren't we? We are, and I'm, mean, yeah, you know, and I, and I don't know. It's you know, that's that's a big ask, isn't it? I mean, especially with the COVID idiots at the moment and um, <laughs> things that you're seeing. It's like, oh my lord, like people yeah. are really bored. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, look, um, you know, a little bit of kindness goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in my other workplaces, um, I talk to my staff about the generosity of spirit. You know, yeah. just reach out and, you know, be kind to each other. Um, I, I want to thank you very much for the time today and, and really how helpful your statement and the discussion has been. Um, as I say, I think it's, it's, it's kind of right on point for us at the moment about trying to have a more responsive, helpful system not a um shut the door and turn people away system and i think particularly in the space that you've experienced over your time um a lot of your statements incredibly helpful around that space which is really good Uh, and i've actually got the um the team that's working on the interface and later on today and i'm going to ask them to reread your statement to make sure that that we're picking stuff up in the right way into the 
into our thinking going forward. So, like, yeah, really, really helpful. Um, and thank you for the time because people are very um, thoughtful with their statements. It takes a bit of time. People have sat down and really thought things through, and I think that's great. Um, also, I just want to say at a personal level, um, you know, that the... the um, work that you're doing and the support that you'll be giving other people, as I say, in a space that's often not been well understood or not necessarily openly discussed, um, particularly from the mental health side about dual diagnosis. I think the AOD sector is different to this, but I think particularly the mental health side has often been much more discriminatory. Um, I think it's fantastic. So, you know, encourage you to keep going and encourage you to um you know do it in a way that works for you though of course um you're the most important part of this so you've got to kind of make it work for you but great work well, i think alex too when i first went into um put myself into rehab i was lucky enough at the time to have cover you know so i could go private and it was a bit of an eye-opener to be in that setting with top barristers um, doctors, so it just said to me, addiction doesn't discriminate. Absolutely not. Um, so yeah, you know, you just, you just. And, and like you, many of them probably had other things going on in their lives. Yeah. They needed to sort out. So, you know, people, yeah. our lives are complex and, um, you know, most people, I don't, I don't know too many people, particularly you and I are similar age. Um, you know, like not, most people have had all sorts of challenges in their lives and sometimes it's been more public, sometimes it's been more quiet and hidden. But I think um, you have to be, um, well, in my world, you have to kind of be non-judgmental and just say, you know, life throws up all sorts of things for people and... Um, all we can do is try and help people to kind of manage it as best we can. I, I just feel, you know, that's kind of where life is up to. Um, when well, you're able, you know, it, it boils down to, you know, were you ever taught the skills when you were young on resilience or, you know, things like uh, emotional intelligence is, it should be taught in schools. As I say, I think they, I think the schools to because we've been looking a lot at what the schools are doing. I think, I think there's a whole lot of reasons why things are getting tougher for kids. Um, you know, I think some of the ways in which the community behaves badly and stuff is getting tougher for kids. But on the other hand, I think a lot of the work that's going into schools around resilience and, and kind of self-awareness and stuff is an improvement to our day. I don't think no one would Oh, well, yeah, I think, I think the generation, like our generation, you know, bullies didn't grow up they just got older <laughs> yeah 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 it worked at school so let's try it at uni let's try it in the workplace you know yeah well no one stopped them no no that's wrong yeah. um i'm gonna need to draw this to a close but i just again want to say thank you very much and karen or phil probably karen is going to i'm sure touch base and catch up with you at some point down the track